Well, first of all, thank you very much for coming on my show, uh, Dr. Mishlove. You are a clinical psychologist who has given yourself to parapsychology and a host of a web series called Thinking Aloud, which I've been binge watching for about two months now, my whole summer, basically. <laughs> so I want to just welcome you to the show. And, and I first wanted to ask you for my viewers to define parapsychology. Oh, okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. Parapsychology is a science. It is the scientific study of extrasensory perception, which includes telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition, as well as psychokinesis or mind over matter, which also uh, includes psychic healing, and also the question of survival after death, and, and that would include uh, reincarnation as well. That's that's a great, you know, small explanation for such a massive field because it you just brought up like ten different uh, different branches of it. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like uh, like as far as science, it go, it's like medicine in that there's so many different areas of medicine and er areas of things you can study. So how does one become a parapsychologist? Because you start as a clinical psychologist, and actually, I got a doctoral degree in parapsychology. Wow. That's, where, that's how I started. And that was unique. It remains today, even uh, almost 40 years later, the only doctoral diploma that says parapsychology ever awarded by an accredited university anywhere in the world. So it's tough. If you want to be a parapsychologist, there are very few venues available. Well, that's true, isn't it? I, I, I run into a similar thing with people asking me, so how do you become a psychic? Like, where where did you get your degree? And I'm like, well, there, in my field, it's really weird because there's no degree. There's no any sort of regulation around it. Yeah. And I, I often refer to um, serious practicing mediums who have ethics in a sense as being pioneers because what were doctors before we had doctors, before there was a university or an ac academia? So... I think of it like a, a, a budding field and, and I really, um, it's just been so uh, relieving for me to meet people like you in my exploration of this because you guys actually help explain what the heck's happening to me. <laughs> uh, that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is really important. Um, the great Victor Zamet, uh, the retired lawyer from Australia who wrote the book, a lawyer presents the case for the afterlife told me when I was very young about 14 he said to me in an email um, make sure you do all of the homework you can to figure out the history of psychics and scientific research of the paranormal and understand who you are because you will encounter someone like James Randi one day and you're going to have to be able to have a good answer for him uh, at least to hold your own and and I've lived by that <laughs> so that's my journey of uh, exploration so what would you um do you, first of all i should ask do you ever address the idea of skeptics in in a serious manner do you ever have you written papers on them or have you ever gotten into a debate with one uh yes in fact it happens frequently uh the debates happen frequently and on my uh, video channel new thinking aloud there are many discussions with our researchers in parapsychology as to how they address the whole question of uh, skepticism because you've you've got some skeptics who are sincere scientists a true philosophical skeptic is a person frankly who questions themselves first and foremost uh, then you have a, a group of people who just find uh, this field impossible. And in a sense, they're not true skeptics. They're already committed to a, a belief that this is impossible. And therefore, anybody who makes a claim of, uh, of a paranormal event of any sort at all is either a fool or a liar. And uh, so they start, you, know, you could say that they are the true believers. Uh, but they'll point a finger at you and say, no, everything that you say is tainted because you're the true believer. Right. They're the true believer that nothing like this is possible. And that's a <laughs> foregone conclusion. And, and it's almost like the more evidence you try to present to them, the more walls they'll throw up. Like I, I've been speaking with some uh, skeptical young people lately. Uh, 
uh, Dave Pakman, who has a, a series on Netflix, and he's kind of a really popular like uh, vlogger, I guess you could say, and he's got like a radio podcast kind of thing going on, and, and he's broached the topic of sub psychics and the paranormal on occasion. He's mostly a political pundit, but he goes into this territory, and, and I, I, I enjoy his work, so I wrote out to him as a fan, and I said, look, like, like here's some here are papers from Dean Radin and here are Victor Zamet and things. And he just, within five minutes, emailed back saying, oh, Dean Radin's never had uh, anything published or anything, uh, you know, credible come out off of his name. I'm like, you couldn't have read <laughs> what I sent you in that time, first of all. But it's just this wall that comes up because it's like they have to protect their version of reality. And since they already are convinced that there's, uh, not that this is completely impossible. They feel no need to acquaint themselves with the actual literature. Well, that's exactly right. And and they use a tactic on me, and, and I don't fall for it. But a lot of psychics I know do fall for it. They'll invite you on their show or their radio program, and they'll tell you on air, or they'll ask you on air to tell them what their grandfather's name is. Mm -hmm. And my answer is, well, what the heck makes you think your grandfather's here right now to tell me his name anyway? Mm -hmm. And... And you, you have to also factor in that in some readings as a medium, I'll see names and details. And in another reading, there are n no such names come up for that person. Mm. Um, and it's different information and the medium's not in control. So it's a little like asking um, a musician to play you your favorite song without the band or a surgeon to go into surgery without the OR. It's like it, it, people have to know what it is and how it works before they can test it properly. Mm -hmm. And that takes me back to your work and... Um, in, in the field, which, so you, you've written a book that I'm, it's the next thing on my reading list. I think it's called The PK Man. That's correct. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that book? Sure. Well, I uh, engaged in a 10-year study of a man named Ted Owens, who occasionally called himself the PK Man. PK is the abbreviation parapsychologists use for psychokinesis or mind over matter. And uh, during that 10-year period, he, he wanted nothing more than to interest scientists in his abilities. So he'd send out letters to various scientists, including my Self saying, we, uh, or he, he would say, I intend to produce a, a large scale demonstration of psychokinesis. It might be a cold spell in the middle of summer or a hot spell in the middle of winter, or he might try to end a drought or affect a hurricane or a volcano or a large scale black power blackout or UFO sightings or a combination of these things. And uh, then he'd be sending in newspaper clippings saying, look, see, it happened, just as I said. Um, on one occasion, uh, he, he sent a message like this to Hal Putoff and Russell Targ, who had a parapsychology research program going on at a big military industrial think tank called SRI International. And they were having a, a drought in California at the time. He said, I'm going to end the drought and you'll know it's me because your local newspaper in a few days will publish a story saying the drought is over, but there's going to be uh, my trademarks. You're going to see every kind of weather, lightning, hail, rain, snow, sleet, and power blackouts and UFO sightings. And within a few days, all that happened. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Russell Targ sent him a message saying that was a great prediction. And he wrote back and said that was not a prediction. <laughs> I caused it. And at that point, because they were getting funding from the CIA back in those days, so uh, they didn't want to have anything more to do with him because he mm -hmm. was what they regarded him as a loose cannon. They they wanted to operate in a very low key way, and they were already working with Israel's uh, great psychic Uri Geller, who was controversial enough. So right. uh, they asked me to, to kind of take over the case. <laughs> yeah. I was an eager young graduate student at the time, so I took the file off of their hands and uh, worked with him for 10 years until he died in 1987, and uh, it took me until the year 1999 to actually publish the book about him because all the things that he did were so bizarre and so amazing, people couldn't believe it was true.
the first mm-hmm. edition of, of this book we sent to an editor and and he said well it's not very it's not a good novel he couldn't believe it was nonfiction. right oh yeah now I'm now I'm really excited this is going to be a great book mm-hmm. <laughs> so psychokinesis is the um, idea it's different from what I do as a medium where I'm just channeling um, discarnates and and information about the future and various things psychokinesis is when you can use uh, some unseen force to manipulate the environment or objects around you and possibly other minds too is that a fair yes you could say that telepathy if you're a telepathic transmission might be viewed as something akin to psychokinesis and in fact that's one of the interpretations of psychic healing that you're sending the healee a telepathic message to heal themselves which they then do it's fascinating i'm i'm working on a book with a colleague of mine who um uh, scribes basically I go into trance and I, I'm new at trance well the last three or four years since 2015 and his cousin in Texas uh, ended up having cancer and we did a healing on her remotely together and during the healing I had heart attack symptoms it was like a really I had a full-blown anxiety attack out of the blue and we didn't tell her that we were doing the healing and later that morning he called her and and said so how'd your morning go she goes, I had the strangest dream this morning I dreamed that I was on a boat in an ocean and the waves were like a hundred feet tall and I was just you could feel every rise and drop and she was being clanked around the boat and bumping into the metal edges and she was like it hurt and she woke up from this and a couple of months later she's been declared cancer free so I I can say from some personal experience it is anecdotal but these are the kinds of things I've I've kind of dabbled in but I don't tell my own clients about this interestingly I, I keep this kind of thing hush except when I'm talking to someone like you because you get it's hard enough for them to get past that you talk to dead people when you start getting into the, <laughs> the realm of infecting uh, affecting the environment and mm-hmm. and actually being able to reach and touch others with your mind that that's too much for people I think well they used to burn witches at the stake uh, for doing that sort of thing and that was just a few hundred years ago so uh, mm-hmm. there's a lot of I guess you'd say subconscious fear in in the culture around uh, psychic functioning so that's what you confront with with this job as a parapsychologist and I was thinking about it this morning before talking to you I was like well how would I define it and and it's definitely got to be a vocation because it's like teachers and police officers those jobs take a tremendous amount of personal sacrifice and commitment and they don't really pay very well and a parapsychologist gets paid even less than them (laughs) well I suppose it depends uh, on on your particular circumstances a number of people who work in the field of parapsychology are college professors so that's true uh, uh, they're probably doing okay. Uh, other people yeah. uh, finance their research through grants and and so on. But you're you're correct. By and large, uh, people working in the field of parapsychology do it because they have a passion for a it. Passion. It's, right. it's the work is its own reward. So you and I know that this work and the implications of it have massive societal uh, potentially big societal impact and and it could I I see it as something that could potentially even start to turn the tides and end war and and various major social issues that we still confront in the 21st century Um, you'd think that more people would know about accredited people like yourself with credentials who can actually you know present information from these expeditions and explorations you've gone on and and more people should be reading your book and you know more people should be watching thinking aloud um but but this is why i'm doing this show it's because they're not the general public doesn't seem to have really sunk in their teeth into this the way that i i assume that they would and i wondered if you had any views on what that phenomena is like what what the heck's going on there well i as i view it bro that's how you pronounce your name, Brow? It's Bro, but bro. it's, yeah, you uh-huh. did better because a lot of people go Brug. <laughs> so UGH is silent, yeah. <laughs> bro. Uh, well, th- the way I see things, it's this. You've got a big section of the population, let's say 30%, who uh, are uh, very religious, and they think that uh, 
Parapsychology is real. However, it's diabolic. So you need to avoid it unless it has the blessing of your particular church or religion. Then you've got another 30% of the population who are uh, materialistic, atheistic, uh, scoffers and skeptics. They think it's all phony. And then so you've got a, a, a large group in the middle, actually. In, in fact, the truth is that roughly two-thirds of, of the population have had psychic experiences themselves. So they're mildly open to it. But in academia, in places where uh, people, for example, could offer research grants in government and academia, uh, in, in businesses, it doesn't matter uh, how interested you are because the small group of people who are avid skeptics uh, and avid uh, religionists who, who think that this is evil will uh, use horse laughs and other kinds of attacks to threaten your career. So, I mean, consider this. I have a doctoral diploma in parapsychology I got 38 years ago. <laughs> and it's still the only one ever awarded in the world. There's this huge social pressure uh, not to acknowledge parapsychology. But I, I will say this, uh, and it's very important. In 1969, the Parapsychological Association formally became affiliated with the American Society or the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the major scientific body here in, in the United States. And that was a big step forward so that uh, I think it's fair to say officially parapsychology is acknowledged as a science. Well, that's, that's really key, and that's really, really important. And I'm so glad to have you uh, explain all of this, because like I said, the, the layman, <laughs> and it's, it's surprising to me we still have so many of them, uh, will really appreciate this. You know, and I, I keep, every time I do this show, I keep seeing to myself this young, maybe it's a couple of young people, young boys and girls, maybe they're between 14 to 16, who are going to see this, and it's going to alter the direction of their lives. And they're going to join the ranks with you and myself and Dean Radin and Russell Targ and all of the all of the big leagues, I think. And it's going to start to spearhead this into the 21st century officially. So that's that's really uh, really kind of cool for me. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd like to wrap up talking a bit about this new obsession of mine, Thinking Aloud, which uh, is your web series that you that you do and you're putting out quite a lot of content I, I notice because uh, I'm never bored there's always something new to see and and things I've missed on the channel so do you want to tell people briefly about that and how to get to it oh okay there are actually two channels on YouTube the original thinking aloud series includes videos that were uh, broadcast all over North America via satellite to public uh, television stations between 1987 and 2002 uh, then there's the new Thinking Aloud channel, and that's A-L-L-O-W-E-D, New Thinking Aloud. It's all one word. You can go to newthinkingaloud.com. And those are videos that I have created in the last three years, just about the same period of time that you've been working as a medium. And I've actually uh, uploaded hundreds of of uh, videos on that channel covering uh, every aspect of parapsychology and related fields with many of the leading uh, researchers. It, it's really a resource for people who are hungry for valid, accurate information uh, regarding scientific parapsychology. And you're such a great host that you make it so easily digestible. Well, thank to anybody you. and that's really important because I think a lot of what you like what's cool about your channel is you don't just talk about psychics and the afterlife you go into UFOs you go into social constructs and and all kinds of fascinating things which I've naturally found myself gravitating toward in the last two years or so being interested in society and culture even uh, because I think there's some shifting going on there too and philosophy is a big philosophy. topic we cover the mind-body problem, for example, is really central to understanding psychic functioning. 
Okay, the mind-body problem. Can you can you paraphrase that for us, please? Yeah, yeah, it's one of the oldest unresolved problems in all of philosophy. And to put it in a nutshell, it's this. How is it possible for the brain and nervous system that are composed of dead, lifeless atoms and molecules to uh, produce consciousness and life? There's nothing about inert matter that suggests that consciousness should exist. So how, how is that at all possible? And when you add to that the research on extrasensory perception that human consciousness is capable of uh, receiving information from distant locations in space and even from the future, mm -hmm. uh, it begins to suggest that there are many things about human consciousness itself that are uh, inconsistent with the modern materialistic uh, scientific paradigm and uh, the reason I think that parapsychology is uh, such a marginalized field uh, is because the findings of parapsychology uh, suggest that we have to take a fresh look at really basic things like time and space and matter and energy and consciousness. We, we really have to think these things through uh, freshly. Nobody wants to uh, rewrite the books, I guess. <laughs> well, there are a lot of very bright minds uh, working mm -hmm. on these questions, and uh, I think that uh, what is coming together is, is a whole new vision of, of reality in which spirituality and science are uh, coming together and uh, actually are uh, coming up with a unified, consistent vision of things. But it's a slow process. Well, that's it. And one thing that I've learned lately, uh, now that I'm no longer in my 20s, uh, you know, that decade when you know everything, uh, is that it's not necessary to throw out the entire rule book. It, it, maybe some things just need a little modification and some branches need to be added to the, uh, to the books originally. And you had actually brought this up on your show recently. Um, I can't remember who you were quoting, but you said that in the field of parapsychology and, and, and studying these phenomena, we can't think of things even in decades. We need to more measure them by centuries, right? So it's kind of like Christopher Columbus confirming that the Greeks were right, that the world was round, but that was like 600 years prior we had that knowledge that the world was round. <laughs> it takes that long for the whole world to agree it's round, which, by the way, as we know, is, is now in debate again <laughs> by a few people. So I yeah. could imagine maybe this is a 200-year a project at least. Well, that was a quote from William James, who is uh, one of my heroes, the founder of American psychology and uh, one of America's great philosophers and thinkers who had a deep interest in questions like survival after death. Uh, and, and yes, he said it's, it's because the field is so profound in its implications, not to mention poorly funded, that uh, progress is very, very slow. In, in the field, but very real. Now, the, the, the research in this area began in 1882 with the founding of the Society for Psychical Research in, in London. So at this point, there's an enormous database, hundreds of scientific articles. And, and I'll tell you something very encouraging, bro. Mm -hmm. Just last month, the uh, American Psychological Association published a, an article about parapsychology in their flagship journal, the American Psychologist, uh, a review of all of the meta-analyses of hundreds of studies in parapsychology, and uh, it resulted in very, very strong statistics and positive conclusions. And this is the first article in parapsychology published in that journal for about 50 years. So I regard it as a very important landmark, especially because psychologists are the professional group that's probably the most threatened by the research in parapsychology. So for them to come out and acknowledge the validity of all of this research, I think the, the paper actually uh, covers the findings of some 1,600 studies published studies in refereed scientific journals. Uh, it, to me, that's an important milestone and potentially a turning point. I'm so glad you brought that up because I heard about that. And, of course, Dr. Radin, who was on my, my first episode, also mentioned that particular landmark. So mm -hmm. what a perfect thing to wrap up with. And uh, I hope we get to do this again. And, and uh, I look forward to our, our future uh, friendship or collaboration or 
whatever. I'll, I'll just beam it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, bro. Okay, have a great day. You too.